So we are going live in three, two, one. So good evening and welcome everybody to the fourth episode of Voice Webinar. And it's my honor to introduce the conveners of this meeting. Uh, our convener, Dr. Uh, Rujita Mehta, is a very well-known pediatric orthopedic surgeon across the globe. Uh, her special take is to be the top 20 woman achiever in model medical care. She is the founder and chairperson for Voice, uh, which is a very, very active community of women authors in India. And she is the founder secretary for Asia Pacific Women Ortho Advocacy Cell. Our co-convener is Dr. Chashnal Rathod. She is working at various hospitals in Mumbai and she has been trained internationally with special interest in cerebral palsy uh, treatment. And uh, thanks for doing it with Ortho TV. Uh, we are here to support Voice and the Worthy webinar series. That's me and my partner, Dr. Neeraj. Thanks again. And over to you, Chasnal, for further. So thank you everyone for joining us today for the Worthy Webinars episode four. And it's been a very special week following the spying day. We have a special Worthy Webinar today with the theme and talks based on uh, spine. So I request uh, Ruchita Mehta ma'am to kindly uh, introduce and uh, tell us a few words about voice. Just tell me if my screen's visible. It's visible. It's yes. visible. Uh, in a minute. Yes. In a minute, I'll just bring up the PPT. So it's basically, I think, a big, big honor to have the uh, president of the Australian uh, Association, Annette, with us today. And also have uh, Dr. Mitch Atkinson. Um, I think there's some lag, is there? Are you able to see my screen? Uh, we are able to see. Avish, open you, the PowerPoint, ma'am. Uh, yes. yes. She has clicked, but uh, it is highlighted, but it's not coming out. You will have to double okay, click, let me I think. Stop share and try sharing again. Yes. And optimize it for the thing. So I think it should be okay. Is it all right now? It's coming. It's coming a little late. It's coming. Don't optimize it, ma'am. Don't optimize Don't, don't optimize. Oops. Optimize will reduce your... Uh, it will increase your uh, bandwidth. will be reduced. Should I share, ma'am? No, just, just a minute. I think I'll be okay now. All okay? Yes. All right, so without much ado, we are not going to waste too much time on this because I think voice is already introduced to everyone and I think it's more important to share the knowledge that the two speakers have over here. But uh, Women Orthos of uh, Surgeons of India came with the environment of our pioneer, Dr. Late K. Mullah Firoz, in whose memory we are running the webinars every Sunday of October because 3rd October was her birth anniversary and National CP Day is celebrated in her name. In 2005, Golden Jubilee, when a few of us came together, we realized that almost seven of us already had won the Marcelo Uribe Zamodio Award at Seacourt. But we didn't have something similar as a platform in India. So we uh, created this mainly for a few reasons. One is membership, which has been increasing to 290 women now. We do a lot of community awareness drives, we do CMEs, and we counsel in words because I think women feel is easily more approachable uh, to their own peers for sharing some of the unique problems in a different speciality. In addition, we are now focusing on these few things like school health and osteoporosis prevention, issues which are special to the women's health. And in IOA, we have UR scholarships which have been dedicated to women, plus a one-hour dedicated session annually in the IOCON, which is a huge, huge thank you to the IOA, because I think the Indian women's voice really needs to be heard and reach far and wide, and a best paper prize in P.K. Mullah Firoz's honor. 
and some of the activities which we've done over the years are uh, there but i think we'll just uh, uh, you know it's more important to focus on today's webinar and let's go ahead with the introductions and the speakers so i quick just a second i'll just share my screen and so the worthy webinars have been basically started so that we could have the best speakers in the field to give their best or the most worthwhile talk or the topic which was very close to their heart and today with us to chair this session like we said, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Annette Holian with us. She's the uh, first president-elect for the Australian Orthopedic Association. And it's great to have to see this position being held by a woman orthosurgeon. And she is attached to the Monash Children's Hospital at Melbourne. She's an orthopedic and trauma surgeon. And she has been uh, trained at the RCH um, uh, Royal Children's Hospital of Surgeon, and she's the chair and board of the surgical education and training program there. And also, she's the clinical director of the pre op services, peri op services. So, we welcome you, Dr. Annette Holian, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. And we are also thankful to you for introducing to uh, us to Dr. Michelle Atkinson or Mish, Dr. Mish. And she's a spine surgeon at Sydney. She's at, attached to Sydney Adventist and Northern Beaches Hospital at Sydney. And uh, she's in the clinical care committee of the Australian Orthopedic Association. And she's the deputy chair of the NSW State Committee with the Royal Australian College of Surgeons. And I think through the Royal Australian Navy, you were serving in Israel probably. Yes, is that right, Dr. Mish? Yeah, so. Yeah. So that is wonderful. That is something very nice and probably you could let us know about it later. So we yeah. welcome you for the webinar and uh, it's very nice to have you. And of course, we are very thankful for Naveen Thakkar sir to spare this time during this busy pre-IOCON time. And uh, thank you sir for joining us. So Dr. Thank Naveen Thakkar sir is the Honorable Secretary of the Indian Orthopedic Association. He has been the immediate past president of the Gujarat Ortho Association. And he has been working really hard for the IOA website development currently for developing good and very healthy uh, working transparent online elections for the upcoming year, year and a uh, lot of other things in terms of uh, for IOA like free bone and joint surgery and special awards for these activities which were declared recently. He has many awards and medals for which he has won over the years and he's the first orthopedic surgeon who has got two US patents and many, many more awards. So this slide would actually fall short to talk about your achievements, sir, and it's difficult to compile everything on a slide, but thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank, thank you. you. And um, so they, are, they will be chairing the session and the first speaker with us today is Dr. Rushma Tandon and she's one of the uh, first female spine surgeon who has been working in India. She was of course the first female surgeon from the state of Gujarat and she graduated long back in 1992 and she's done spine surgery in 2002 from Northern Railway Central Hospital followed by various fellowships the AO fellowships in, uh, fellowship in Zurich, followed by in Helsinki, in Melbourne and Singapore. Currently, she is uh, the chief orthopedic surgeon at Northern Railway Central Hospital, New Delhi. And she is uh, currently the chairperson for Women in Spine Surgery Task Force with the AO Spine. And she's the regional board member of AO SAP. Also, she has been, I think she's, uh, we missed here, but you were the, in the executive committee of the ASSI also, if I'm not wrong, Dr. Rishma. And she's the founding member of VOICE. She has supervised and guided nearly 20 students through their research thesis. And her special interests are degenerative spine, trauma, and infections of the spine. So we welcome Dr. Rushma Tandan with us. And the second speaker, of course, with us, Dr. Ram Chadda, sir. And it's an honor, sir, to introduce you here today for this worthy webinar. 
and uh, sir is of course a very well-known spine surgeon across the country and globe. Sir is a consultant spine surgeon at various hospitals across Mumbai. He has been ex-professor and head of department at KJ Sumaya Medical College Hospital. He has been ex-visiting consultant at various hospitals in Mumbai. He's been the past president of Association of Spine Surgeons of India, past president for Bombay Spine Society. He has held other various positions like being past president of the Bombay Orthopedic Society and chief national delegate for the India APSS and AP, uh, APSS Society. He is council member for the APOA and he has pioneered for the minimal invasive cosmetic spine surgery in India. And he has used endoscopic spine surgery for the first time in India since 1998 to perform various difficult surgeries as mentioned here. So thank you so much, sir, for being part of the worthy webinars and we welcome you to this worthy webinar today. So the first talk will be by Dr. Rushma and I'm going to quickly I'm going to start the talk. So, just Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Rushma Tandon, presently working as the head department of orthopedics at Northern Railway Central Hospital in New Delhi. I am also the community development officer of AO Spine Asia Pacific and on the regional. That's not we can't hear. For the ladies are cycling in tandem. Now is it okay? To move forwards. This map at Northern Railway Central Hospital in New Delhi. I'm also the community development officer of AO Spine Asia Pacific and on the regional board. Today afternoon, I will be discussing the topic of tandem spinal stenosis, its diagnosis, management, and prognosis. What does the word tandem mean? It is a word used to refer to a group of persons or objects working to these or cycling in tandem to move forwards. The term tandem spinal stenosis was first introduced by Dagi in 1987. It describes concurrent symptomatic cervical and lumbar spinal stenosis, which is combined, simultaneous, concomitant and concurrent. These tandem age-related changes in asymptomatic subjects can be seen in up to 78% volunteers. That means that the prevalence of degenerative spine disease, including tandem stenosis, is seen on many, many MRIs in asymptomatic patients. The radiographic signs of such changes are seen in 50% of the population over the age of 50 years and 75% over the age of 64 years. Why is this most common in the cervical and the lumbar spine? It's very obvious that these are the more mobile or the most hypermobile parts of the spine. And that's why degeneration occurs earlier and is also more common in these parts. Looking at the historical review, as early as 1984, Nancy and Joseph Epstein described coexisting cervical and lumbar spinal stenosis and discussed its diagnosis and management. However, Dagi, in 1987, published his landmark paper of tandem lumbar and cervical stenosis and described in detail the natural history, prognosis, and results after surgical decompression. What is the etiopathology of tandem stenosis? The etiology remains the same as any other form of spinal stenosis. It could be aging or degenerative, arthritic due to instability like spondylolisthesis, congenital, post-traumatic, or due to tumors. What is the anatomical classification? 
All tandem stenosis are a combination of mixed stenosis of central and lateral types. The classification remains the same with absolute stenosis of less than 10 millimeter of the canal diameter and lateral stenosis of less than 2 millimeter as the diagnostic criteria. How do we classify tandem stenosis? Etiologically, it could be either congenital or acquired. Clinically, it could be without signs and symptoms, could be functional or with myelo and radiculopathy. Symptomatically, it could be transient or mild, moderate or continuous, and acute or severe with sudden onset of radiculo or myelopathy. It could also be classified according to the area in which the stenosis occurs. And what is the etiology, whether it is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament or ossification of the ligamentum flavor, and depending on the area, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, in combinations of all or any. The clinical presentation of tandem stenosis, you see the patient walking into your outpatient with a broad-based, unsteady gait. He could have low back pain, sciatica, shoulder or neck pain with hand weakness, paresthesias, sphincter disturbances, and also positive Lervet phenomena. The classical triad of symptoms is of intermittent neurological claudication with a progressive gait disturbance and myelopathy and polyradiculopathy of both the upper and the lower limbs. The incidence of tandem stenosis very, very less. Overall incidence is only 1% of all patients. In the final stage, the clinical presentation of both the levels and seals, and the features of this type of concurrent stenosis are present, and both the upper and the lower limbs are affected. On clinical evaluation, the higher mental functions of the patient may be impaired because this occurs in the elderly. It may be associated with a CVA, which further confounds the picture. A detailed neurological examination is necessary, with parameters of grading being the NURIX criteria, modified GAOA score, and Ranawa's myelopathy score. NURIX grading, as you all know, is from 0 to 5. From the patient being normal, having a normal gait, but with radiological signs of cord compression, to gait difficulties, but he's still walking around. Progressively, he finds it difficult to continue with his activities of daily living and then becomes wheelchair or bed bound. The modified GOA score checks motor dysfunction, sensory dysfunction, and sphincter dysfunction and grades it from 0 to 70. Severe patients have a score of 0 to 7 and have a poor prognosis. The diagnostic sign of tandem spinal stenosis, however, remains numb and clumsy legs versus the numb and clumsy hands of cervical spondylotic myelopathy. We come to the investigations. What investigations would you like to get done? X-rays, of course, MRI, CT or a CT myelography, and electrophysiological investigations. X-rays, the findings are the same as spinal canal stenosis in any area of the spine may be degenerative or associated with OPLL. You can see listesis or instability, degenerative scoliosis, or loss of cervical lordosis, as is seen in the x-ray on the right. On CT or CT myelography, you can see the bone formation in the lumbar spine and the compression of the cord on the right-hand side on the myelography. What is the myelographic criteria for lumbar canal stenosis? There's narrowing of more than 50% of the dural sac, the dimension of the spinal canal of 10 millimeter or less, disruption or block of contrast material flow, a lesion may be in contact with the posterior part of the cord, there may be a deformity of the cord, there may be a disappearance of the subarachnoid space. I can, you can see the bone arising from the cord. These are the defined sources, as you can see them as described before. You can see the cord compression, you can see the signal intensity change, you can see the degenerated discs, and you can see the facetal hypertrophy. MRI grading of spinal canal stenosis is from 0 to 3, with absence of central canal stenosis going on to cord signal changes in grade 3. This is a normal MRI classification, which predicts the risk for tandem cervical spinal stenosis. So, if you have a lumbar canal, which is globally compressed, as is seen in the fourth picture, or the bottom right picture, they describe four kinds of lumbar uh, 
canals. One is normal, one is a tapering kind, one is an hourglass kind, and one is a global compression kind. So if a patient has a globally compressed lumbar spine but is still asymptomatic, he has a very high risk for tandem cervical spinal stenosis. What are the electrophysiological studies and what do they tell us? They tell us the degree of denovation, the number of roots involved, the increased latency of the motor evoke potentials. This also helps in the differential diagnosis for motor neuron disease. It also tells us the extent of sensory changes and peripheral neuropathic changes in patients with concomitant B12 deficiency and diabetes mellitus. There are many, many difficulties in diagnosis. There may be predominant features of one level over the other. Signs and symptoms of the lumbar spine are usually obscured by those of the cervical spine. And this disease of the second level goes unrecognized. Differential diagnosis, the top ones to consider are motor neuron disease, peripheral neuropathy, Parkinsonism, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and cerebellar disease. How do we manage these patients of tandem stenosis? Symptomatic patients with mild to moderate symptoms can be treated conservatively. Most of them are of lumbar canal stenosis with very little cervical component. The patients who deserve and need surgery most are those with symptomatic cervical stenosis and severe lumbar stenosis. These symptoms fall into two groups. Those who have continuous symptoms and chronic symptoms for 18 months or more, or those who have an acute deterioration and they come to us with a history of a fall or a history of a jerk or that they just suddenly stopped walking. And that is when we have to do a surgical intervention at the earliest. What are the kinds of surgery you could do? You could have a state surgery in two stages, or you could have a single multi-level surgery. State surgery, always, always cervical first. The initial spinal decompression of the cervical spine reduces the radicular symptoms in the lower limbs and eliminates the need for the second stage of the surgical treatment. However, if you have cervical stenosis and you do a surgical intervention at the lumbar level, this contributes to exacerbation of the neurological symptoms caused by compression of the cervical spine. What is the prognosis? Prognosis of patients with tandem stenosis and myelopathy is the same as that for isolated myelopathy or isolated lumbar stenosis. So there's no difference in the prognosis and the overall picture of the patient needs to be taken into consideration. Adequate decompression is the key to a good surgical result, whether do you do a staged or a simultaneous surgery, whether do you do an instrumented or an uninstrumented surgery. Let's look at some cases. This is a case of tandem stenosis, as you can see. The cervical spine is severely compressed. There's some cord intensity changes. The lumbar canal is also severely compressed, as can be seen on the right-hand side and the sections in which there's facetal hypertrophy, ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, as well as severe mm -hmm. central and lateral canal stenosis. This patient presented with signs and symptoms of cervical malopathy, acute onset of left upper limb radiculopathy, claudication, and superadded diabetes mellitus. This is what we did first. We did the cervical decompression. We did an anterior decompression with the cage. 10 years on, this is the MRI picture of the patient. You can see he has adequate subarachnoid fluid and good decompression of the cervical spine. The patient has not had a lumbar decompression till date. The second case, 55-year-old male, came to me with complaints of neck pain and bilateral shoulder pain since one year, difficulty in walking and increasing weakness. This is something of a typical history of a case of tandem stenosis. Shoulder pain, neck pain, going on to numbness, suck walk with support. Then the bladder and bubble are involved in activities of daily living are severely restricted. On clinical examination, most patients have a normal higher motor function. They can be bedridden. They are unable to grip the walker also properly. Patient was spastic. Hoffman's was positive. Rabinsky was upgoing and bladder and bubble were also involved. Neuric spread was 5, GOA score was 7, that is very severe. What investigations did we get done? We got the x-rays and the MRIs done, and they show you severe stenosis of the cervical spine with cord signal intensity changes, as well as severe stenosis of the lumbar spine. How many surgeons get a routine screening spine in case of cervical myelopathy or lumbar canal stenosis? 
This remains a very, very important investigation in every patient of either lumbar stenosis or cervical myelopathy. If you do not want to miss a case of tandem stenosis, then a screening of the spine is a compulsory investigation in cases of these. Now, what are the surgical options in this patient? Either I could have done a cervical discectomy alone or a cervical corpectomy alone, or I could have done a posterior decompression alone, or I could have done a combined anterior and a posterior decompression. So what did I do? Did I do the lumbar decompression first or the cervical first? Did I do the cervical and then follow it up by the lumbar? Did I do both the surgeries in the same sitting? That is my dilemma. So I decided to do the cervical decompression first. I did an anterior cervical corpectomy, fixed it with a plate and a cage, and simultaneously in the same sitting, stabilized it posteriorly also. This is the post-operative result. The patient has improved significantly and has, again, not needed a lumbar surgery at all. This is his lumbar spine MRI now, and he does not want the surgery. This is tandem stenosis with ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament in the thoracic and the lumbar spine. This is the CT scan of the patient showing the stenosis, as you can see, at the thoracic and the lumbar levels. The top MRI showed the stenosis of the lumbar spine, and the lower two cuts or sections show you the post-operative MRI. So we did just a simple laminectomy or a simple decompression with no fixation whatsoever, and the patient is now walking. This is another case in which you can see that the patient has cervical stenosis and lumbar stenosis with great difficulty in walking. But the x-ray shows that he has a severe degenerative scoliosis, as can be seen by the scoliotic curve of the spine, and instability on the lateral view, as is seen by antrolysthesis of vertebral bodies over the other. So what did we do in this case? We did not do the cervical decompression first. We went ahead, we fixed and fused and decompressed the lumbar spine. And when we got a scanogram done of his lower limbs, we saw that he had severe osteoarthritis of the knees with virus deformed. This patient underwent lumbar surgery and bilateral knee replacement and has done very well after the surgery. What does the review of literature tell us? Is congenital bony stenosis of the cervical spine associated with lumbar spine stenosis? Yes. Congenital stenosis of the cervical spine is definitely associated with stenosis of concomitantly of the lumbar spine too. This predisposes to tandem spinal stenosis. The largest study has been the Wakayama spine study of tandem spinal stenosis, which determined the prevalence of radiographic tandem stenosis in association with developmental canal stenosis. They proved that the prevalence of tandem stenosis was significantly higher in the degenerative group than in the non-degenerative group. Does lumbar spinal stenosis increase the risk of cervical cord compression? Let's look at the reverse thing. Yes, the presence of symptomatic lumbar stenosis does increase the incidence and risk of spondylotic cervical cord compression. And its prevalence is also higher in patients of symptomatic lumbar stenosis compared with the general population. This is very interesting. State surgery for tandem, cervical and lumbar spinal stenosis, which should be treated first. The dictum is very, very clear. Cervical stenosis should be treated first. 67 to 70% of patients do not need the lumbar operation later on. But if you treat the lumbar stenosis first, the 91% patients will have dramatic exacerbation of symptoms in a short interval and will need the cervical operation nevertheless. So the need for the second stage surgery for non-operative stenosis differs significantly. Another interesting paper, which shows us adjacent and skip lesions of the cervical and the dorsal spine, skip lesions being defined as at least more than three vertebrae apart from each other. In case this of skip lesions, you should always do a two-stage surgery. In case of adjust lesions, if the patient is willing to accept the risk and has a good body condition, then he can have a single state surgery. What does the literature say about simultaneous decompression? There are many, many papers which say that patient morbidity is higher than reported for isolated spinal decompressive procedures. However, functional outcomes are not adversely affected by a simultaneous technique, and patient satisfaction is high. So if the condition of your patient is good, then you can go ahead and you can do a simultaneous surgery on the cervical and lumbar spine. 
It is short lasting. It is under a single anesthesia. It reduces morbidity and hospital stay as well as costs. It gives an early return to function and high patient satisfaction rate. So, according to this paper from published in the European Spine Journal from Ajit Krishna and Bharat Dave from Ahmedabad, um, they seem to suggest and feel that the surgery can and should be done together. Further research is needed on this topic. There's a lot, lot out there that we don't know anything about. What is this? What is the true incidence of asymptomatic tandem stenosis? What is the natural clinical and radiographic history of such incidental lesions seen on MRI? Do they progress? What is the true incidence of the symptomatic tandem stenosis in the population? What we see on MRIs is one part of the picture. Does this really translate into clinical signs and symptoms in our general population? What is the statistical coincidence of tandem stenosis along with motor neuron disease or along with Parkinsonism? Because it masks the symptoms of the Parkinsonism and Parkinsonism and motor neuron disease mask the symptoms of tandem stenosis, thus depriving patients of much needed surgery with which they could maybe walk much better. What is the full clinical spectrum in this condition? And what is the optimal interoperative interval? Should we operate them together? Should we do it simultaneously? Should we do one after the other? And what are the long-term results of such surgery? These are the questions that remain unanswered and need further research. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm now ready to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rushma, and uh, we are open for questions. So I request Dr. Michelle, Dr. Annette, and Dr. Naveen, uh, Ram sir, please, if there's any questions, please do it. Hi, I was just wondering, have you yourself noted deterioration in patients that you've operated on for lumbar stenosis? Uh, yes. Yes, I have noticed this. In fact, uh, because you need to turn the patient prone and, uh, you know, so, so you're always very careful. Uh, if you do the lumbar first and you have missed the cervical, so that, that is why I said that we always, always get a screening spine done. Right. But the clinical, clinical picture of the patient, suppose the patient has cervical myelopathy or radiculopathy in the absence of myelopathy, but radiological signs. So you see in, in uh, the criteria of cervical myelopathy, if you see cervical myelopathy alone, in the operative criteria of cervical myelopathy, in the presence of radiological signs of severe cord compression, but if the patient is not spastic, radiculopathy alone is an indication for surgery. Yeah. You see. So, so if you see very severe cervical cord compression and the patient does not have spasticity, even then if he has radiculopathy, you would not do the lumbar spine first. You see. No. So, so these, these are the you know, final points. And as you go along and you, you see more and more cases, uh, I work in an industrial organization and uh, mm -hmm. most of the workers are using heavy machinery and things like that. And so right. I feel that we see many more cases of degenerative spine. And uh, mm -hmm. we also look after the retired population, that is the people over the age of 60 or 65 years. So I yeah. feel that we get many more cases coming back to us. And so that's how we have a slightly longer follow up. And so um, as I showed you in my last case, uh, the patient who had severe osteoarthritis of the knees and an unstable lumbar spine. In yes. that case, in that case, in the total absence of any cervical symptoms, I did only a lumbar surgery, and I yeah. did, and he went ahead with the knee replacement surgery, and mm -hmm. he's fine with no cervical surgery. So I think it's over the years you just you know you just learn to fine tune your treatment to suit individual patients. And how do you position the head and neck to avoid extension and compression when you're doing the lumbar spine? Just in the normal way that we put it on a headrest and we just, just in the normal way. We, we make sure we don't turn it to one side as we would normally do. 
and right. the lumbar spine. We make sure we put the headrest and you know we we position the neck if we right. think there is any doubt. Otherwise, we would just flip the patient over and turn the neck to one side and, and go ahead. Right. And in your, in your cervical cases, when you have the radiculopathies, mm. do you feel they originate? Uh, one or two levels disparate to the clinical signs related to cord compression rather than radical compression? Uh, you mean that the uh, level of radiculopathy is different from the level of what you see yeah. on the MRI? Is that what you mean? Yes. Uh, so patients with a T1 lesion who actually have cord compression at C5-6. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the radicals being compressed before they actually leave the cord. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't actually. Uh, what, what do you think about this? Ram, That's would you like to comment? Well, truthfully, I look at cervical myelopathy uh, usually as a slightly different animal from a cervical radiculopathy. Um, when I look at people who are elderly, uh, they may have radiculomyelopathies, but it's a much younger patient who has a pure radiculopathy. So if you're looking at those who need, who come under the tandem stenosis, I'm basically looking at a degenerative cervical myelo, plus or minus myeloradiculopathy, and a lumbar canal stenosis, central plus lateral, primary or secondary, which means complex or simple, whichever way it may be. And uh, what Hushma has suggested uh, is something that has made me think a lot because I am one of those who believes that if I can have a patient who's fit and willing for a cervical decompression, then the lumbar is far simpler, quicker and easier to execute at the same time. Mm -hmm. Am I clear on the same page? And and I would not uh, hesitate in going ahead with my lumbar on the same day. In fact, if I have a high-risk patient, I would probably stage him the other way around, which means that I would go one by one and probably do the lumbar if he's really got a lower motor neuron type of a picture predominating over an upper motor neuron, and then relook at the upper motor neuron. But I rarely would do a purely posterior cervical and leave the lumbar. Yes, if it's an anterior cervical and I need to flip over, yes, I, I do agree. I could stage it out. But very rarely would I do a posterior long segment cervical and not address the lumbar because I have the patient in the position of my choice. I can have a second team that's working with me. And halfway through the first, I move on to the second. So that's how we do the tandem. Right. And, and, and uh, I but Ram, <laughs> yeah, but Ram, I think coming back to Annette's um, uh, Mish's question about the radiculopathy, I think that uh, I think that in some patients they have uh, uncle hypertrophy, which is a part of the degenerative process, and yes. so there could be a mismatch, you know, between the root compression and the cord compression. I, so I, that I, is that is a possibility. And secondly, about yeah. what Ram is saying about um, doing the cervical and lumbar. A lot of my patients, I can tell you, Ram, have not required the lumbar decompression at all. No, so I'm, it, I, it, I, there are many me think, with, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. In fact, I'm learning from you. What I'm trying to say, it's made me think. It's made me think yeah. that uh, what you're saying with your literature and I need to follow. In that case, I, I would be happy not touching the lumbar spine. I, I, I'm not denying that. I, it's so, making me think. That's all. So, so I think takeaway for the general orthopedic surgeon is to look for the complex pic picture of the human and element signs mm -hmm. to diagnose. For the yes. general orthopedic surgeons, because uh, so many general orthopedic surgeons are so also listening. So what is the message to the general orthopedic surgeons to look for the UMN element sign? If it is a complex picture, you think about both the involvement. Yes, because most of the neurological claudication comes from the lumbar spine. The myelopathic long track signs come from the cervical spine. And so it's a mixed picture. It's a mixed picture. 
So I would recommend that in every case of cervical myelopathy or isolated severe lumbar stenosis, you must get a screening spine done. You must so get the, it done. So there will be gait changes. When there is a gait changes with yeah. the lumbar spine changes, then you have to look for the cervical spine. And just like in the trauma, yes. one joint above, one joint below, you have to screen the one yes. segment of the spine and below segment of the spine. I think, I think to getting a screening spine done is a small price you will pay for not missing a diagnosis. Believe me, I, I have done a this diagnosis <laughs> before. Yes. I did a lumbar spine and I once missed the thoracic uh, compression, you see. And then I had a spastic patient post-operatively. And that taught mm -hmm. me my lesson. And then I developed this interest in tandem spinal stenosis and began to uh, get the screening mm -hmm. spine done. It was a bad experience. I did the lumbar decompression and I thought it was all done. But he had myelopathy post-operatively. The other thing which I could just interject here is that if you have a sincere, technically sound electrophysiologist who understands you, who speaks your language, and with whom you can on a regular basis interact, then your electrophysiology, which is your elect EMG nerve conduction, MEP and SSEP, could help you in more ways than one, not just in taking a decision which of the two is the major offender, but also the disparity between the clinical radiological mismatch, as mentioned by, by Mitch, about a radiculopathy at a higher level vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, 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 a decompression or a visible compression at another level. Because we have not yet started using functional MRIs or tactography, which may come in in the future to probably answer your question. But till that time, the electrophysiology, if you have someone on board, who's been doing it focused, it can help. But then unfortunately, most of our surgeons, us surgeons, including me and many more, don't really pay much heed to our electrophysiologists, unfortunately. <laughs> so there is no consensus between two groups, stage surgery or a concomitant surgery. Is there a consensus? Uh yeah, if your patient is fit, if your patient is fit, see there are, there are two schools of thought. One is that if you have cervical myelopathy and you, if that is the predominant clinical picture is of cervical myelopathy and patient does not have much claudication, then you can do just a cervical. If the patient has both and is fit for surgery and is willing to take the extra risk, then you can do both simultaneously. But I would not recommend it. I would not recommend it, except in those who have ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament as a skip lesion, not a continuous lesion. I would not recommend it. Considering the large number of cases who never need the lumbar surgery, I think in degenerative spine, it is much better to decompress them stage by stage. That is my, my personal opinion after so many cases. Yeah, I, I will like to test this out because I'm listening to what you're saying and I would usually stage it six weeks apart, yes. but now I'll leave it longer to do the lumbar spine and see how much they recover. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned if you had a patient with spasticity, do you not operate if they're spastic? Do you not operate? Do you decompress the cervical spine if they're spastic? Yes. Yes. You do? Mm -hmm. yes. And have you had a case? So I've had a couple of cases over the years where I've they've been spastic, I've decompressed the cord, and they really their spasticity is what kept them walking. And they've been too weak to walk properly after I've decompressed them. Yes. I think and it's it is been a poor result. Yes. Um, I have seen this result, uh, this kind of a result is more common in patients of ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament in which, you know, the compression is so acute that uh, you, you suddenly decompress. Uh, I don't know what is your, but we people do a lot of open door cervical laminoplasties also. Right. We have OPLL, uh, we do a lot of laminoplasties. And uh, we see more uh, post-operative palsies and we see more neurological deficits because of the posterior shift of the cord. Though you see yeah. a very good pulsating cord, you know, compared to a laminectomy, in a laminoplasty, you see a very good pulsating cord and you're very happy that the cord is so well decompressed. But I've seen yeah. this problem more in patients of OPLL than in, in a degenerative patient. You know, the patient is for long uh, adjusting to his problem and the cord has been adjusting for a much longer time. I also think there's a vascular component to this, you know. Oh, uh, so do I. 
Yes, in degenerative spine, there is definitely a vascular component, especially anteriorly, when we're operating from posteriorly, which, which when we decompress, we really don't know how it is going to behave. That's right. And I don't think there's anything which can really predict what is going to happen. We just we can just hope for the best. Yes. And when you're choosing your levels in a cervical case, mm -hmm. do you de decompress an extra level proximally to allow the cord to float back? Yes. Unless yes. unless indicated otherwise, uh, C3 to C7 is a standard level of decompression for for mm -hmm. all cervical myelopathies. If it is C3 to C5 also, we take it one level down. If it is, but C3 to C7 is more or less the standard level of decompression. And when you do your open door laminoplasties, you don't fuse? Uh, no, we put in the spaces and we put bone yes. graft on, on in the gutters on both the sides. We do fuse, we do fuse. We use either plates, mini plates, or we use the peak spacers, and mm -hmm. then we put some graft. Great. Well, uh, Chairperson, may I ask a question um, on behalf of voice? Narushma, you really chose to walk down a very different path many, many years back. And what do you think has made your journey in spine surgery the most worthwhile, a field which is so complex? A field which is so unpredictable and a field where the stakes are really so high. So what, what advice would you give for young aspiring women who want to take on spine surgery? And uh, I will be repeating this question to Ram as well after his talk. Uh, I think that more and more women should do spine surgery. The reason is that women have more patience. Uh, they are more likely to stick to, to fix protocols and uh, suggestions. Uh, they have more competencies in dealing with long-term disease and chronic diseases. You see? So, and spine surgery is, is a very, very specialized surgery. It requires a lot of concentration. It also requires a lot of stamina, physical stamina. So, though the le learning curve is tough, the results are very gratifying. The results are very gratifying. I would, I would tell all the ladies out there that you, you all of you must go into spine surgery. And it's, it's such a wonderful branch. And I'm sure that uh, Ram and uh, the others will agree with me on this. All right. So uh, if there are no other questions, um, and uh, we can go only, ahead with only, Ram. Only one, question, talk only, and... only one question. Do you do yeah, grading no, of the lumbar and cervical spine and make a common grade for both the conditions and then uh, select? Is there any grading system? No, it is a personal uh, choice no. or an individual's choice only. No, it's, it's just we go by the new degree. It's, it's a functional criteria. It's a fun by the time, see, till the patient is walking, even with an, with, you know, going about his activities, he's not going to come to you for surgery. It's a very educated and a very, uh, you know, till they are walking around, they don't come for surgery. It's no, only no. when once they are they, actually once, not. Once, once they come, do you have any yeah. grading system to. Uh, yeah, we have the new grading. grading system. Yeah. Yes, yes. The duration of the symptoms decides the prognosis. The MRI findings decide the prognosis. And the NURIX grading and the GOA score, this decides the prognosis. So we have, a, we definitely have a proper grading system. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. We assign a score to every patient. Yeah. Well, so that was, I think, fabulous. And uh, let's ask Anesh to give us some remarks, and then we invite uh, Ram for his talk. Well, I'd just like to thank um, Rushma and Mitch for giving me a lot of insights into spinal surgery. It's one of my great mysteries in my career. So I'm on a learning experience tonight, along with many other people who are watching. Thank you. Uh, mute Chasno. Uh, next, we have Ram, sir. Uh, Ram, sir, please would you share your slides, sir? Good evening, ladies and a few gentlemen. Uh, it's indeed a privilege, and it's probably the first time in my life that I have a few women listening to me and probably may agree to disagree with me. However, as I said, 
it's indeed a privilege to be speaking to all these highly qualified women and a few of them spine surgeons. And I would begin with where Rushma and Mish probably came to an end. And I agree with them that more women should take up spine surgery because I strongly believe women are much better than men and making unhappy people less unhappy. A spine surgeon does just that and I can be quoted, and I don't mind that, that we as spine surgeons only make unhappy people less unhappy. Hence, I bring something that has been working on my mind for the past five years. Am I naturally stupid, or is it that artificial intelligence is taking over? In the year 2016, I moved from Mumbai to a place in Navi Mumbai because I was attracted by not a woman, but by a robot. I moved to a center which had robotic spine surgery. And why did I do that? Well, I take you back about two decades. This is one of the young ladies who came to me with full faith. And her family was an integral part of my counseling. We spent some time before we finally decided about a year and a half later that I would correct this adolescent idiopathic scoliosis with the armamentarium that I had at that time. Post-operatively, like most men orthopedic surgeons, we celebrated in the evening, not realizing that the young girl could not move her lower limbs, more so on one side. I was upset. Where did I go wrong? Were these screws inadequately, improperly placed? Well, that's when I thought I was not naturally intelligent anymore. But then I went back. Was this a skill-based error or was it a mistake? Did I slip while performing some action? Did I forget a step? Or was it that I followed the wrong rule book or was I not knowledgeable enough? Maybe all put together because wisdom comes where knowledge ends. And then I've been thinking, I now can look back and look at these small craft Santas that my son made, four of them over the week before Christmas. And I realized they were all beautiful, but they look very different. That's the Indian bread or the chapati that my mother makes. Each one very tasty yet very different. Anything that's done freehand will be different. Yet, when it matters of process and products, there has to be the same repeated step with the same repeated result. Yet, with technology, we are still groping in the dark. This is the technology that I have used over the last two decades now. Have I reached this page where technology is helping me or am I helping technology? The CRM came in. We've now got intraoperative spinal cord monitoring. Well, the robot came in for the knee earlier. Over a period of time, I had access to an OAM. And finally, I moved from Mumbai to Navi Mumbai, New Bombay, to use that small Pepsi can, which was the Mazor robot which was launched about nine years back, and I had access to it about five years back. I thought I was practicing safe spine surgery. Was I really practicing safety first, or was it the artificial intelligence driven by a robot? I believed that I could put in a huge amount of metal now more safely than I did a decade and a half earlier. I believed I could plan and put my screws in much better, wider, properly getting into the pedicle, not infringing onto the neural elements, getting a good length and a good purchase. I could plan them and do them in the best possible way. Then came literature in 2016. That's the time I started using this. 24 patients, 121 screws, freehand fluoroscopy versus percute robot assisted screws. 341. Lo behold, 90% of accurate placement in robot assisted, while 73.5 in freehand. 
Well, that's not which mattered to me. What mattered to me was the last line. Implant revision due to misplacement, almost 5% with free hand, worldwide literature, and less than 0.6% with robot assisted. This is significant. We then found that we moved ahead. Navigation and robotics came together. Mesor became Mesor Renaissance, become Mesor X. Other companies jumped in. The Rosa came in from Zimmer. Globus came out with the Excelsius GPS. Today, these are all three state of the art. We have instruments, we have everything, but still these are devices that we hold and who scrub in with us during surgery. Unlike what most people understand where the surgeon sits in a remote place and controls these, we are there and these people handhold us or we handhold them during the entire process. Went back to think, 1997, deep blue. That was something which was an artificially intelligent robot, which contested with the then, then chess champion Kasparov. Game one, tournament one, Kasparov won. Game two, tournament two, Kasparov won again. But game three, tournament three, it was deep blue. And it was deep blue, deep blue, deep blue thereafter. Once deep blue got to know the way Kasparov sinks, there was no looking back. Extrapolate, fast forward 2016, deep mind. It beats the world champion at the go, which is a very, very popular sport in the eastern part of the Asian continent. Having said that, we now realize that mastering the game of Go with deep neural networks and tree search is something that is capable by a machine learning or deep learning program. 2018, Alibaba, Jackie Ma, built AI that can read better than the average human. Well, we are now in a situation where the AI or artificial intelligence is fighting against us, the natural intelligence. Is the artificial intelligence throwing us spine surgeons out of business, out of work, and will it extend to the orthopedic surgeons and to the healthcare professional in the long run? Well, your guess and my guess are probably the same. We have to look back and think, are we going to be in future working for the robot, where the robot is a much bigger version of us, or are we going to be working with the robot? Give it a thought. As I look at it, newspapers are full, including the Indian newspapers, of how artificial intelligence is the way forward. In fact, it's very interesting that Christie's, which actually auctions the best of natural creations by human beings, could artificially intelligent created portrait get auctioned at that level with a Christie's? Yes, it was. Dollar four three two five zero zero, created by artificial intelligence, looking so very natural that it got auctioned at that value by Christie's. So imagine where the color robot is getting. Yes, this would be ideal where the mundane activities could be taken care of, the monotonous tasks would be looked after, records, treatment design, get virtual health assistance. But that's not where we should be looking at the threat. The threat is going to come when people are going to be paging for a doctor robot. We are going to be having a doctor robot radiologist or a doctor robot pathologist. God forbid we may have a doctor robot surgeon in the future. Are we ready for this? Initially, when it came, it was intriguing. Later on, it was inspiring because we were getting additional hands to help us. Intriguing when we could actually communicate with patients through the ICU without really seeing them and having a remote access. And finally, innovating where we are watching a robot perform the surgery. Mind you, two years back, there was the first robotic death where a similar surgery was being performed. Hence, it still goes to prove that the robot can go wrong. Go back to 1941 about robotics and AI and what Asimov said. Three laws of robotic. 
a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to be harmed. That's rule number one, law number one. Law number two, a robot must obey orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law, which is doing harm to the human being. And number three, a robot should protect its own existence as long as protection does not conflict with rule number one and two. That's what Asimov said. But coming now to 1988 and then moving forward, we are getting virtual reality and we are getting robots who are going to probably be like Avengers and we really don't know what the future is. We have literature coming in saying that robots are doing better orthopedic knee replacement, LASIK eye surgery and hair transplants more precisely than the expert surgeon. Where are we going? Well, Albert Einstein said, the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. Hence, we have to now see to it that we are not restricted to just what the airline pilot does, which is assists in the takeoff and the landing, and the rest of it is done by the robot. Friends, we need to think about it. And ladies, you got to think about it more than us because you can show the way forward. Well, I am here to change your perspective because I still believe that we naturally intelligent or stupid people will outlive artificial intelligence. This is my perspective and I'm here to share it with you. Why do I say that? Because I believe common sense is not a gift. It's a punishment because you have to deal with everyone else who does not have it, including the robot. Today, the robot is a threat. It is a tough time. But believe me, it won't last forever. Tough people will. If you believe that you are in competition with the robot, just keep going through hell. Keep going through. It will end and be optimistic. Why do I say that? Because I believe that there are three H's and three P's involved. There's a heart, there's a head, and there's a hand. There is a purpose in the heart. There is a process in the head and there is a product in the hand. The head is the process. Well, the robot can do that. There's a hand, which is the product. Well, the robot can do that as well, but the heart, the purpose, the robot cannot, cannot decide why a procedure needs to be done. Hence, remember, a robot can at the most inform, humans will communicate. A robot can replace the mind, humans have a heart. A robot can become at the most a user of the hand and become a laborer, use the hand and the mind and become a craftsman, but he has to use the hand, the mind and the heart to become an artist. A robot cannot be an artist. Robot can answer how and what. Humans know the why. A robot may at the most define the process and the product. Only humans, doctors, healthcare providers can clarify the purpose. AI versus the doctors. Well, think about these words. They're all English, but look at them a little differently. A robot can touch, but you and I can feel. A robot can hear, but you and I can really listen. A robot can look, but we can really see. Robots have a sight, we have a vision. A robot can do kriya, that's do his duty, but humans can do karma, which is far beyond the duty. A robot can contact and do yoga joke. We as humans can be empathetic, compassionate, and we can connect and go beyond. We can do selfless work. We can do altruistic activities, which a robot cannot. Whatever these three, huge big men who are world leaders we have done or said, I still believe and firmly believe that artificial intelligence cannot and will not replace doctors, but doctors who use the AI, use the robot, will probably replace doctors who do not. So ladies, start using the robot, but keep the robot as your servant and not as your master. Thank you all for a very, very patient hearing. 
I have very little evidence on this, little bit of experience, but when we put all of that together, someday in between, we shall derive an expertise where natural intelligence with artificial intelligence will come together and will take us beyond most and more. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. It was an amazing talk. It was lovely. And the topic is open for discussion and comments from the chairpersons. Uh, Anit, any comments for Dr. Yeah. Ram? Yes, thank you, Ram. I really enjoyed your talk. I was a bit worried robots were about to take over my, um, or you were thinking robots would take over the profession, but I'm glad you came down on the same side as me. Um, so I don't think it's actually a question, but um, I have always been struck as a surgeon that the patient's um, perspective on recovery is very much um, guided by their beliefs. And so the kindness at the bedside, the um, compassion and understanding you give to a patient gives them great guidance in their recovery. Um, I, the head nodding, I guess I didn't turn it into a question, but I, but I genuinely, you know, believe that patients' ability to get better has a lot to do with their trust in the relationship with their caregiver. I, I am in 100% agreement with each word you say, because I believe that you may spend 20 minutes executing a micro lumbar decompression, which is a standard low back surgery, which most of these lovely women must be performing. But 20 minutes of that surgery should only follow two hours of proper counseling and building up a connect with the patient. That's what actually ties the crisis, not the surgery. Yes, thank you. I'm fully in agreement. Dr. Nevin, did you want to ask anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the message has been given. What are the issues with these uh, robots? Registration failures or software failures, Dr. Ram? What is your experience? Well, I'll be very frank. First and foremost in our country is the expenditure involved per case. Yes. If this were free, we would all use it because yes, it would make our surgical execution safer. It would be less invasive. We could predict at least the implant placement part of it. Although I don't totally agree that implant placement is what gives the result. It's the proper choice of the patient and the procedure which gives the result, but the execution would be far more precise. So that could be done. It would be safer, just like we use neuromonitoring and we feel safer, we'd use a robot and get safer. But otherwise, it's the amount of money spent on healthcare, which in India, as you know, is more out of the pocket. It's a big challenge. But as and when things do come down, I believe it would be an asset and we would use it more regularly. How do you compare with the uh, OR? Well, the OR is, 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 is today, right, please understand, they've, they've now reached a stage where the OR is combined with the, they are now robo-navs. There's a robot executing and there's a navigation. So it's everything that's happening online. See, in, in the robot, which was the primary generation which I used, which was the Mazor Renaissance, which, which has all started, well, in all those things, you make the mistake and then realize, rather than that, you should realize the mistake before you make it. So that's where RoboNav is coming in. So um, the OARM is brilliant. I still believe it's the gold standard. I still believe the OARM is fantastic. But yes, the amount of exposure of radiation to a young woman who's undergoing a surgery and uh, having had a preoperative CT scan and then the OAM shoot more than once. Well, if I can get away with something which has far less radiation, I'd probably take that for my daughter. Right. So you rightly said the robot is a tool only, and that helps to make a good surgeon more precise and effective, but will not make a bad surgeon a good. No, fool with a tool is still a fool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Michelle, any comments? So I agree with those comments wholeheartedly. And we here in Australia, we have the OR but we and the MASA in some institutions, but we don't have it in our public hospitals. 
again, it's a cost issue. Mm. Yes. Is there any evidence that, I think you said not, but is there any evidence that the well-placed screws give a better clinical outcome? No. I don't think there is for knee replacements either, that the placement is more accurate, but the outcome isn't necessarily better, particularly when we take the costs into consideration. Well, the only difference between a knee replacement and spine surgery is that a knee replacement, the short-term result would not really show anything different with an improperly placed implant. When I'm using the word improper, it's not grossly improper, but the difference between the one executed freehand versus the one executed by the robot. But in a critical spine surgery, um, a couple of millimeters here and there can be the difference between mm. neurology post-op and neurology post-op. Mm. That's the only difference. Yep. I mean, it decides yes, so I think, biology I think and the way we look at it. Sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, the way we look at it is, is people that have to go back for surgery to move a screw that's irritating a nerve root or we're still pushing on the cord. That's where the saving has been. Okay. Yes, that, that's improved with well placement, particularly yeah. with regard to spine. Yes. So Ram, you re recommend for the complex anatomy, uh, not for the routine uh, pedicle screw or something. Absolutely. It's very much recommended for the complex anatomy. But Naveen, we need to understand for a surgeon to execute it on complex anatomy, the learning curve is through lesser anatomy, which is lesser yes. complex anatomy. Right. That's how it works. You can't... I know, I know, I know. I, 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 I inserted with the KY with the extra control that so many in your presence. <laughs> So we have to we have to go up the ladder. So that's yeah. how it works. <laughs> You're on mute, Rajita. So um, I, I robot in any other field of orthopedics doesn't seem to have that prominent uh, discussion as in spine, as in uh, replacement. And somehow it, it seems to have skipped pediatric orthopedics entirely. So since you're experienced in it, I mean, do you see any possible indications in pediatric scoliosis surgery or any other uh, parts of pediatrics? Ruchuta, if I may answer that question. Um, the Newer generation robot, which is the second and now the third will come in, is going beyond the axial skeleton. It's going up towards the brain, it's going down to the pelvis and even down to long bone. And believe me, once it comes into the pelvis where it's ready to go, I'm sure it's going to add immense value to your planning and execution in the pediatric gamut. It's really, really going to make a lot of a difference. Like uh, it has worked already in adult spinal tumors and pelvic tumors where the planning is similar. And I have a friend in Hong Kong, we both of us know, who uses initially a planning tool, which was 3D, but now he's also moved to using the robot and is getting the excision of these tumors out much better. So it can be done and it will. But will it come to the pediatric hip and deformities? I believe it will. I believe it will. So that's, that's something for us to look forward to as well. And uh, should you uh, want to give the voice girls a message in terms of uh, how should Voice India now be progressing? I mean, you've been a close friend. You've been a mentor in so many ways. You've uh, actually supported us in so many of the programs and helped us take it further. So, I mean, you know, kind of a direction or a path for the future as you envisage it as possibly somebody who is going to be leading IOA someday. Um, thank you for all your kind words, Ruchita. First and foremost, uh, as I look at it as an orthopedic surgeon who was a trauma and pelviacetabular guy and then became a spine surgeon and hardly ever dabbled in much of pediatric orthopedics, the first thing I'd like to tell all these smart, beautiful ladies that there's more in orthopedics besides pediatric orthopedics and hand. A lot of them get stuck with pediatric orthopedics and hand. And as you see both Rushma and Mitch, 
who are really doing a great job. And I do know of some very, very aggressive spine surgeons worldwide who are ladies. So spine surgery is something that you guys should. And as mentioned by both, it is something which entails a lot of patience, persistence, resilience, and grit, which women have innate in their DNA much more than we guys. So I believe you should get into spine surgery. And with the tools coming in where the physical uh, sort of challenge is getting less, unlike what it was 25 years back where reducing the femur was even not possible for lesser evolved men as I, uh, it's now becoming a much easier sort of thing to execute. And you can get into spine surgery and look at those nuances where you need to spend more time because women are more empathetic than men and spine surgery needs empathy and compassion. You people can spend so much more time on all these chronic ailments much better than us. Let the men do the trauma, just leave it to them. But there's so much more in orthopedics and you can really contribute where the gentleness, your compassion, your selflessness would work. And uh, as I've felt over the years, um, there's so much of orthopedics besides orthopedic surgery. And as people grow older, pediatric orthopedics is one. You women should also concentrate on geriatric orthopedics. The old and the elderly, and we are all getting there. I have a 99-year-old mother. Ruchita, you have uh, uh, people in your 80-year-old. <laughs> and we know that, that these people need much more than just surgery. And probably there's a huge space and a vacuum lying there. And we need the women to at least empower themselves to look after the children, which is true, and to look after the elderly. Let that young man with a fracture shaft femur go to some guy, he'll fix it. Forget about that. <laughs> but you've got so much more to do. And I want you people to come up. We need more people. So yeah. please yeah. encourage more women and get them into orthopedics. Uh, there's a lot of warmth and compassion that orthopedic needs. And we need more color at our meetings. Not if I would have attended many more of these meetings if there were so many of you around. Anyway, thanks a lot. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Ryan. To, to continue yes. that, you have suggested that you have 290 members in your force. Yes. So make them yes. IO members. Now hurdles yes. are less. Now uh, everything uh, probably yes. will go online. So I'm that will thankful be to you for that because yes. it's very useful online to connect with anybody across the country. And especially in terms of the pandemic, I think that is a very welcome move that uh, you have really contributed for IOA. And yes, they're all in the pipeline. Some of them are still PGs. I think most of our members are PGs. So they're all becoming associate members and we keep pushing them. And we Ram, will. Ram, Ram, Ram is saying that in Goa, we need more colors. <laughs> yes. yes, they'll be there. <laughs> Okay. So I think Chastal, this has been a very, very nice, well-crafted, excellent speakers I, and fantastic chairpersons, so supportive in every which way and a lovely panelist as well. So let's do our vote of thanks and our strong and silent Ashok is back there. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Voice, we are extremely thankful to Dr. Annette and Dr. Mish who have joined us for this webinar. Of course, thanks to Dr. Naveen Takkar, sir, for joining us for the chair, being chairperson. And our wonderful speakers, Ram, sir, and Prishma, ma'am, thank you so much for being there with us here. Uh, we are thankful to Ashok Sham and Dr. Neeraj Bijlani and Ortho TV for supporting us throughout this worthy webinars. And special thanks to the uh, IOA TV, Ortho TV, and Women uh, Ortho Worldwide and APOA Waves for supporting us during this webinars from all over. And thank you, Rishta ma'am, for being there as a strong uh, guide and mentor for voice and everyone around. And with this, we come to the end of the webinar today and we look forward to the next week's webinar. Grand finale. Yeah, it's gonna be the final webinar and it's a grand finale webinar and uh, Thank you so much for being with us. Have a great evening and good night, ladies. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank good you night. all.